Okay, awesome. Okay, so yeah, so today we are actually gonna uh, learn a bit about funnel analysis in R. So we're gonna use R studios and we are gonna use uh, R Markdown to produce a report that we can later on share uh, within our team or with our boss, with wh whom, whoever we want. Um, and we are gonna have some little help from a package that's called RSQLite. Um, R, yeah, RSQLite, yes, of course, uh, which is a package that helps uh, run um, SQL queries directly in the Markdown file. And um, as, um, yeah, we are gonna have just a, a little agenda. So I'm gonna briefly gonna introduce uh, the concept of funnel analysis for those of you that maybe are not familiar with it. Um, then we're gonna have a look at an example of conversion flow. Um, and then we are gonna get our hands dirty with uh, the tutorial uh, on our studio. And at the same time, I'm gonna show you how we can report the insights that we gather from this analysis directly um, on a presentation. So I'm gonna be switching tools back and forth. Um, if at any time you don't see, or you think uh, you are not seeing the screen you should be seeing, please <laughs> warn me. If I'm talking about data and I don't have data, warn me about that, okay? Awesome, so I'm gonna go straight to it. Um, so, What's fun and analysis? And I put this picture here from Melissa McCarthy's spy, because I actually feel that fun and analysis can be seen as a spy tool. So what you do when you do fun and analysis is actually following. So you're, you, they allow you to follow your users throughout a series of defined events and to calculate the given event to event conversion rates. And I am conscious that I already said three complex phrases that need to be broken down a bit. Um, so I'm gonna start with follow your users. So what that what actually means is that uh, we are able to track the behavior of users on any app or website, or if you want also throughout uh, any process of any kind. So that's the idea. So the ability to know where pe what people are doing at any given time on a specific app, website, or uh, process. And when we talk about defined events, um, this is actually the steps that users need to take to meet the final goal, right? So if we are, um, if you want to buy a pair of shoes uh, on Zalando, then those will be the steps that you go uh, from entering the website of Zalando to actually go and searching for the right pair of shoes and finally buy the pair, right? or uh, this is maybe for the academics among ourselves, uh, imagine that you want people to participate in a multi-day online experiment, maybe on Gorillas or on MacTurk. Um, and every single day, people have to do, participants have to do a series of steps to be able to participate in your study. And um, finally, the final goal would be actually complete the study, right? So run uh, all of the, 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 the days that they are expected to, to go through. Uh, for your experiment. And finally, when we talk about conversion rates, so um, the conversion rate idea is literally like response to the, the question, what's the percentage of those people who went to Zalando, who completed each step and ended up buying that pair of shoes that we mentioned before, or uh, completed that experiment that we put a lot of effort and um, time into. And um, for me, the, the fun thing is that funnel, when I think about funnels, uh, what I usually have in mind is um, a type of tool that allow, yeah, that allows me to move a liquid from one container to another, right? So that's usually what you think about funnel. Um, and this is funny because if only users behaved like a liquid, right? So we wouldn't even need to have a funnel analysis if they were liquids. Um, in fact, um, although the, the word funnel seems to be a bit controversial here, the idea is that you can think of users or participants uh, more like 3D um, spheres. And you put them in the, you insert them at the beginning of the funnel. And because they have a certain volume, not everybody is able to get to the end point. So you only manage to get a certain number of people throughout the funnel. 
And this is why funnel analysis really help identifying barriers that can cause users and participants and whoever we want to leave before they actually reach the conversion point. So buying the pair of shoes or uh, completing our experiment. And of course, important to mention is that um, while uh, we identify the barriers, so we identify where, so where in the funnel people get stuck, um, it's only afterwards that you can actually um, query and try to understand why, the why they did that, right? So it could be maybe that the instructions or the page they are visiting maybe wasn't, wasn't clear 100%. Maybe they understood they weren't interested. Um, maybe there were too many steps. So imagine when you sign up in a new, um, I don't know, new social media. So you have to put your name, you have to put your surname and then your email. And oftentimes you're actually, you have to go back in your inbox click and confirm the registration, right? So these are many steps. And for many people, these many steps are too many. <laughs> so just, they just leave. Um, or finally, that could even be that something that you're trying to sell is just too expensive for people and they don't go through it. So as I mentioned, fun analysis is like the first step where you get to identify what or where, um, where more, mostly uh, people are leaving. And then you, you, do ha you have to do some, some deeper analysis on that. Uh, now I'm going to show you, yeah, if I can ask, so there was a question in the chat by Thomas, who's asking if there's a GitHub re repository for this. Uh, there will be. Um, I haven't put this uh, online yet, uh, but we will put it online uh, as soon as we, I guess, today, between today and tomorrow. Thank you. No problem. Okay, so um, here I'm going to show you an example of a conversion flow, which is just another synonym for a funnel flow just to, to be clear. And uh, this is coming from the tech industry. So this is a very, very uh, familiar concept for um, businesses that, companies that produce software, pieces of software, yeah. And you probably are familiar with this concept as well, maybe not um, consciously, but it, this, it will, will sound very familiar in just a few seconds. So many of this company, what they have is this business model that's called freemium. So freemium actually means that you are allowed to use uh, the software or the app or the tool for free, uh, but you have only access to a subset of the features and the functionalities. And whenever you want to use something which is more, maybe it's fancier or more sophisticated or maybe more useful in general, uh, what you have to do, you have to um, convert your free account into a premium or paid account, right? And the idea is that most of the time, um, this is kind of, it's triggered by what we call trigger. And they can be very, very different types of trigger. And I'm sure you're going to recognize them uh, over here. So most of the time, this upgrade flow starts when uh, you see a banner or, or a message or pop-up similar to the one that you have on the screen. So maybe it's Spotify telling you that um, if you click on the, on the green button, uh, you can start premium free for 30 days or uh, YouTube now would very, very keen into selling YouTube premium. Every time you go on YouTube, you have this advertisement popping up and say, hey, why don't you try this? Or maybe if you're using a specific software or a tool or an app, if you want to integrate it with something else, usually that's not done for free. So you have to upgrade your, your account and you have to pay a bit of money to be able to do that. Um, and that's like a very, very, very common business model now in the software business. And the idea is that the upgrade flow actually starts when you click on what we call, in jargon, we call them call to action. So this colored button. So anytime you click on them, um, you uh, what you usually see is something like this. So this is like an in-app pricing page. I mean, I put it small because it doesn't matter now the details, but the idea is that you may have several maybe tiers in terms of pricing and depending on what are your needs, if you need to have three people on board or a team of hundred, um, you decide exactly what is the tier that you, you want to purchase. And if that it's something that you are willing to pay or you think it's worthy, uh, you select uh, the tier and uh, what you usually see is a payment detail page, 
right? So uh, it will ask you to insert your name, um, your credit card um, details, and everything you need to uh, complete the purchase. So when you actually click on purchase, uh, the payment is successful and you have moved from a freemium account to a premium one and the upgrade flow, so this idea of the flow, is actually completed. Okay, any questions so far? It's clear. Okay. And I'm just going to briefly introduce two concepts or two metrics that are very, very common in this type of analysis that we are going to see um, oftentimes also during the, uh, the hands on section. Um, so, what we will be uh, looking at, it's something that it's called step by step click through rate. Um, so, which is nothing else but the number, the percentage of times that someone clicked on every button. So um, many people have seen the trigger, how many of those people actually clicked on the button and moved on. And many people have seen them in a pricing page, how many people click and move to the next one. And of course, in this case, um, users can start the flow multiple times. So this will make sense later when we do the analysis. Uh, but the idea is that you, um, yeah, anytime you get, you get on YouTube, you have that pop-up coming up, right? So uh, you will see it many times and until one time you decide that's worth your money going on and buying it. And it didn't work for me yet, YouTube, I'm sorry, <laughs> it's not working. Um, and then we have what we call final conversion rate. And the final conversion rate is actually the percentage of times that someone complete the purchase. So while the step-by-step, -step, of course, is something that uh, we, we count at every single step, of course, the conversion rate takes care of the whole flow. So how many people started it and how, compared uh, to how many people actually completed the whole, um, the whole step, the whole flow. Okay, so I'm gonna now set um, our mission. So imagine that we are, um, we can be data analyst or also product analyst, which I think maybe it's, uh, they're very, very close in terms of what they do. I think they are not different. It's just, <laughs> just two different ways to call the same thing. Um, and this is our mission. So our company, so our fake company, uh, aims to convert more users from free to premium plans. And the way they are doing this is by having some fancy features that are available only if you pay, okay? So the tasks that we are gonna be carrying out are the following ones. So we're gonna prepare the data using SQL. And the reason why we're gonna use SQL and not Tidyverse, for instance, is simply that usually, um, especially in product teams, and especially when you're doing an interview, for instance, uh, the thing that everybody wants to check is that if you have any experience with SQL, which is like the basic, the most basic programming language. Um, so sometimes you, and, and also I think it's the, the one that it's the most well-known across different people using different programming languages. So if you use Python or if you use R, it wouldn't matter uh, because you would have the common language. It's like Esperanto, right? You have the common language that everybody should speak. Um, and that's SQL. And um, then we're gonna analyze this data with some funnel analysis. And finally, uh, we have to prove our value, right? So we have to show that we can suggest hypotheses based on this data. And we maybe can suggest some product changes uh, that can be put in place to improve the flow. Okay, so we are gonna now move to our studio. So this is actually a good time to have to, to ask questions if you have any. I'm also gonna have a look at the chat just to see. All right, no at the moment. Okay, awesome. So I'm gonna jump into it. Um, yeah, you're gonna actually, you're gonna see me. Uh, maybe I should have shared this before so you could have run uh, your script on your own computer. Um, but it's nice to also see building up little by little because I think it, it is a bit complex somehow. Um, so uh, you can see my screen, right? You can see my R. Awesome. So let me just clean uh, the console in the workspace. Yep, it should work. Okay, so now we are in R. Everybody see it. Do you need maybe, uh, do you need me to maybe make the font bigger or is that big enough for you? I think it's big enough on my computer. Okay. I know people have different computers with different screen sizes. So 
if anyone disagrees with me, tell Sarah. Uh, so yeah, I think that's good enough. Okay, awesome. So then I, I can make it bigger if you need. Um, okay. So uh, this is an art markdown, um, our markdown file. Um, I don't know how, how many of you had the chance to work with a markdown file. The idea is that uh, it allows you to um, put together snippets of codes. So what you have over here and also textual information, almost like a TXT file in that sense. And the good thing is that when you knit, so that's the comment. So when you when you put together all of your uh, your file, you actually get a document that you can share and that it's independent of the of the script. So in this case, for me, uh, it's always HTML. So I will output at the end an HTML file that I will share with you. So that's the idea. Okay. So just to recap, so uh, we have our background story. So our fake company has a freemium business model. You can use the basic features for free, but you should pay if you need extra features. As the company aims to convert more users from free to premium plans, triggers are shown. So the, our pop-ups and messages that we saw before are shown when users click on blocked features because they are fancy and they can bring value and money. And something similar is also shown if users by themselves go on and click on upgrade buttons on their um, account. Imagine you, know, you have your, your account page. So the first thing we are going to do, we are going to set the setup um, options directly in the first snippet of code. Uh, so what you see over here is just very um, some, some settings for, for messages not being shown directly in the page or warnings or something, something like that. And here I commented out the install package functions for some of the um, packages that we're gonna use. I have them already. You will have maybe the possibility to uh, install them. And I'm actually gonna load all of the uh, libraries. And, and this is where we start, okay? So uh, we the first task was to prepare data using SQL, right? And I put just a little description of what SQL is. So SQL stands for Structured Query Language. And as I mentioned before, it's very, very standard old fashioned programming language uh, that's used to um, manage relational database. Um, and the idea is that you can perform various operation on the data that you gather from these databases. And it's actually older, much older than R and Python. I think we are talking about like decades older. And being able to use it is one of those, you know, technical skills that I mentioned that you uh, you have to have as a as an analyst uh, working in industry. And usually to query data, uh, you would use an external tool. So you would you use something like you know a relational database management system. And here are just some of the most common ones. So you have Oracle DB, MySQL, Microsoft SQL servers. So they are servers that you use to pick and choose and, and create this data, this, this data together. It's a bit different from what maybe we have in academia where you have one CSV file, which is very nicely. Usually you have, you know, you design your experiment and you put your settings so that it outputs a clean. You have dirty data just because they have liars, right? It's not dirty in the sense that it's not structured. Uh, but when you have multiple um, CSV files and they are connected by only one little connection, you have to put them all together and you have to join and do things. And the way you can do that is by using um, a database management system. And the cool thing is, of course, is that um, both Python and R have now packages that you can use to run snippets of SQL codes directly into uh, the, the file. In this case, it's a markdown, but it could be just a simple R script, if I'm not mistaken, I think. Um, okay, so with this second snippet of code, what we are gonna do, we are gonna use um, RSQLite, which is one of the two packages that allow us to do that. And we are gonna simply create this connection between uh, the, the script and the server that it's on, on the cloud. Um, and we call it con, and that's as much as you need to know because I also don't know much more about that apart from, <laughs> from this. So I'm gonna run it. And now you see in the global environment that it's that the connection happened, so it took place. So we have a connection with the uh, database system. 
And what do we have in terms of um, data sets, right? So I have in my uh, folder, so if I go files over here, we have a series of folders uh, of uh, CSV files over here. And they are, um, one it's called accounts.csv. So it's just account information, status of the people, blah, 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 blah. Then we have another one, which is clicked locked feature CSV. And this is the, we will see there, every row is a user and you have information about when they clicked on one of those features that it's fancy. And if you click on it, you will see the message that says, hey, uh, that's something that you can't do. You have to pay for it. Here. Okay. And then we have click upgrade CSV, uh, where we have every row is a user, the time, and where this, this person clicked from. So if I click on a feature that it's locked, I have a banner. And if I click on the upgrade button, then I will have something like banner related to feature one, something like that. And so this is literally every single one of this file is literally one of those steps that we saw before in the flow. Uh, same goes with the in-app pricing, view payment details and subscription created. Uh, just a little reminder for uh, maybe the people that are a bit less experienced. Remember that if you have your R Markdown file sitting where the data sets are, um, when you have to, when you load the, the file, you don't have to specify the whole path. So you don't have to say C uh, column slash slash uh, user and then all that thing. You just put the name and between commas. Okay, just a little tip. So what we're gonna do now, uh, we are gonna load the data as tables and tables is just another word for databases, okay? Um, so we have them here. We use the same packages that we saw before. So SQR, SQL um, and DBI. And there we are. And what you can see is that it's different when, uh, from when you, of course, you're loading, we are not saving them at the moment. So what this function does, it allows me to create a table, so to write a table using the connection that we created before. And it's reading my CSV file, which is in my um, folder, and it's calling this table accounts. Um, and you see it's different from when you load directly the CSV file because you don't see it in the global environment. So um, if I wanted to do that, then I would have to specify again here account um, and assign the function to, to, that, to that one, to the name. But they are loaded, so trust me. Uh, in fact, if we do it again, we should have a, yeah, table accounts exist, is in database. Uh, so it'll ask you either to overwrite or append, but we can't do that because that's uh, settings, default settings, not allowed to do that. Okay, so we have it. Now, the very first thing I want us to do is to explore the data and try to understand which features are locked. So which are the fancy features and how often are they clicked on? And um, we are gonna use this very first for function formula um, and we, we're gonna see how, how it works, okay? So here, the snippet of R and we have the DB get query. So we say again, hey, connect to the database. Uh, and now this is SQL um, code and scripting. It says, okay, select um, and select me what? I want you to show me the count of all the locked feature name, which we saw before was one of the column um, and call them clicks and tell me what's the name of those things. And, and do this by looking at this click the lock and to group by like the usual, our usual group by that we would use in tidyverse or um, on any, um, yeah, tidying um, up and package. Um, and we, we have it there. So I'm gonna show you how it looks like. And then if there are maybe questions, I can also show you. So, okay, so simply what I told the, the data is, hey, you have this bunch of rows and every row would have a user and it would have a, um, features that was clicked on. So show me how many times there was a click for every single one of the features that are locked. 
Um, and here we have all of the, so we, what we can see here is that we have all of the 10 different features. So on, on the right side and all of the times that those features were uh, clicked on, let me actually add um, an extra bit so that we, uh, yeah, so that we have it ordered in the sending order over here. There you go. I see there is a, a question. Maybe. So that we can kind of practice along. Oh, okay. I can see that the question from Van is to have the CSV. Um, yeah, I have to make some some changes with the CSV so that they can be shareable. Um, I will definitely um, share with you later on the, the files. So I'm sorry for now not having them. You, um, but you can ask. Keep asking question if you feel like uh, maybe not not having like learning by doing uh, exercise at the moment is making it a bit difficult. Sorry. Okay, so. I have a question, Sara. Yeah. Sorry, I think it's yeah. just me clarifying something that I missed. Um, so now what you're doing is you're using SQL functions, but you're just doing them in R, but you are basically now doing SQL stuff. It's just you're able to work within R Studio. Mm -hmm. Those functions don't look very familiar, but the yeah. 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 I yeah, I indeed what I'm doing now. So I will. I also have like later on. I also have some regular R snippets of codes that maybe. So I, I use um, ggplot too. So you will you will recognize a bit more the uh, the scripting. But the idea is that um, tidyverse, for instance. What's the other one? What's the other package that we use a lot? Uh, that's not tidyverse. Come on, the the other the other one that it's usually gets overridden if you do it in the wrong order so it's not tidyverse it's the other one which one uh, i forget now as well um oh someone said data dot table the other one that, that you use group by with <laughs> a lot <laughs> <laughs> data table um Whatever. I mean, the idea is that uh, you have many packages on R that are used to reshape data tables, uh, like data table, which is the um, built-in function. And they are all built on the concept of SQL. Dplyr. Thank oh, you. Yeah. Thank I was you. just about to say that, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is the one that always says that you have an error if you if yeah. install them in the in the wrong order. Yeah, so Dplyr, for instance, right? So no one knows how to say Dplyr. Like, it's really hard to pronounce. That's why I never remember. <laughs> Dplyr, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but there as well, you have group by, right? Um, so the, the whole idea is that you can shape a, a data set and make a table and create something that it gives a glimpse of the data immediately. And they are all based on very simple SQL queries. So SQL is actually not very complex. I mean, literally what you're telling is select something and then from where and group by and order. There are, of course, many more complex functions, but I'm not going to use them in this uh, script also because I'm not super, super, super um uh, familiar with sql myself so i only know the basics and they say that the basics you pick them up very quickly the hard stuff it can take you know a lifetime <laughs> so <laughs> take the basics for now <laughs> yeah and i also see there is a question from uh lisa that says what's the benefit of connecting to the data directly rather than using csv and joining within the R environment. Yeah, so as I mentioned before, unfortunately for uh, when, you, when you apply for a job or when you have a job interview, most of the time, uh, especially in the industry, they, um, they may not be super big fan of R um, and to make sure that they are not giving you, you know, any disadvantage or advantage of proposing to have Python, uh, a very, very common practice is to uh, just assess your SQL, um, yeah, your SQL um, skills. And the idea is that because it's so basic and so neat and clear, it's almost like it's, it's a fake coding because you can actually read it. It's almost like natural language in a way, right? You're selecting something. So you're using very, very self-explanatory um, commands in that case. So it's just another skill that you can put on your uh, CV, I guess. Okay, so um, I'm gonna keep using more or less the same type of complexity uh, for SQL. So we are gonna get used to it little by little, okay? 
So what we, we were doing here was just a quick exploration. So you have 10 different features, they were blocked. And here you have how many times people were clicking on those features. And you see that this overboard limits pop up uh, came out a lot of times. So that's the most popular one. So it means that it's behind the feature that a lot of people want, right? So a lot of people um, want something and they can't have it and they have a pop-up. So we are gonna have a look later if that feature is the feature that brings people to pay, which is the, um, the aim of our fake company. Um, okay, so now another little quick exploration so that we get acquainted with the uh, formula. So now what we wanna try to understand is from which triggers. So here it was which feature you click on. Here is from which trigger. So from which message, pop-up, banner, um, the upgrade button was clicked on and how often that happened. So we are in the next step of the, of the where is my, over here, we are in the next, sorry, we are in the next step. So uh, we are seeing, okay, so from which trigger we get the upgrade, which is this first day. So I'm clicking in here, how many happen? Okay, so, and what we do is running exactly a similar, very, very similar uh, formula. So we say, hey, count for me how many clicks you have uh, for each one of those banners and tell me, over those banners, sorry, group by, and tell me how they are called. And please order them by clicks in a descending order. So same as before, we have them here. And we see that, um, you know, if there is a dashboard toolbar, so something like, I don't know, a toolbar on the, the, the top of a page, this is the one that people click the most on. Uh, people that want to have high resolution to export their files in this fake um, app, fake software that we're using, uh, this is the second most clicked thing. So when, when, I, when I say click on, on upgrade, it means like, huh, I see something that I like. So if something that I like, it's telling me that I have to pay and I click on the first upgrade, it means it's something of value, right? Otherwise, it doesn't have value. I close it and I move on. So the more I, I click on something and move on, then the more I actually like and people see value in it. Okay, so very little disclaimer between click to lock feature, so this one, and click upgrade, these are two different data sets. There are some naming inconsistencies. And you can see this because here you have 10 rows, so 10 features, but 26 messages coming up after. So uh, we are gonna try to understand how to simplify this. This is very common with like uh, non-academic data because it, people are not so, I guess people are not so, there are many people working on creating the, the data frame on creating the events and things. And maybe they are two developers and maybe they are not consistent in how they call things. Or maybe something stopped working and they created a new version and the old version is like a legacy that stays in the data. So it's very, very common. Um, but the important thing is that uh, this is not a one-to-one -one mapping, right? So we keep that in mind. Okay, so now that we talked about like the, I call them the boring stuff because it's uh, to be like, yeah, meh. Now let's move to the fun part, okay? So now let's talk uh, about the fun and analysis that we have been introducing since almost uh, half an hour ago. <laughs> okay, so, so we said, so this is a flow process. Uh, the first analysis we are going to do is this final analysis. And what we want to try to understand is, are there specific drop-off points throughout this funnel that are going to hinder the final conversion rate? So they are going to make people not create a premium subscription. And here, I'm going to use some SQL. And then I save the values that I get from them. And then you'll see a nice ggplot that uh, we're gonna pay, paste on our presentation for our product manager or from our boss, whoever wants to look at our data. Um, I just put a little disclaimer here uh, that what I've been using, so this is slightly more complicated, but it's not. So the only thing I do, I am using and pasting two things together which is the user ID. So it could be uh, Sarah mm, underscore one, two, three, four, five, 
together with the time, the time of me clicking, which could be the 11th of November at 7, 12 p.m., um, which is the time in Italy. <laughs> and um, I'm pasting them together. Why? Because many times when you have software and, and things are happening on the online, I don't know if you have happened to you as well, but sometimes you click on something and something doesn't work, right? And you, you, ha you have to click another couple of times before that things happen. Uh, this is called rage click. <laughs> and you can probably understand why it's called the rage click because people are really raging over those clicks that that why why is not working so that's that's rage click so if a user clicks two or three times because um maybe there is a problem with the connection it takes time to load uh people get angry and then you have multiple records for the same person clicking on something so here i'm just pasting together these two information uh so that we have something that's called like tracking ID was like a unique ID. So something completely clean and we have only one of them. Okay. Uh, okay, so step one. What I wanna have here is my SQL code to tell me how many distinct users, so how many users uh, are clicking on the first upgrade button. So we are in here. Um, and I see the trigger, maybe this one, I see the trigger, how many people are clicking on this of all the people that saw it in the first place. And I save this in a variable over here. So, and I just put this little snippet of code that said, hey, select the value, please do not select the whole table. I, I will show you what it looks like over after, so over here. Like, look at this. So if I run this one now, this is uh, the value I called. So SQL did all the calculation for me. I didn't have to do anything, just one snippet of code. And it's telling me that I have 11,798 people that clicked on that upgrade button, okay? Uh, but this looks like it's actually like, um, uh, it's not a value, it's like a data set with that value in it, right? So if I include this little bits, this is literally something that I learned online. Huh? I don't <laughs> do anything. I was debugging. Uh, so now what you see is that this is actual value. So I can't even open it because it's, it's just a, a equal this number. And the same I do. So I am calculating how many people move from, from here to here to here to here, the absolute number. And then I will try to understand how that converts in terms of percentages. Okay. So I do uh, step one I did, step two, which is the other bit. So it's about getting the pricing. And then I have the one, the people that proceed to the payment details and the people that final, finally confirm the subscription and paid. And of course you can see that the numbers are reducing. They're getting smaller because people are lost on the way. And I wanna show you how now we can use all of this little thing and put them in a, um, some, some prep and then put them in a SQL, uh, sorry, ggplot, uh, funnel plot, funnel chart. Okay, so this is a, a bunch of codes that um, you, will, you will see if you try out yourself this, um, um, you literally have just to change the first step. I took it online and um, I just uh, edited to my uh, needs. Uh, but the idea is that you're setting the stages. So by the staging, I mean like the band, the bands, right? So you had this funnel, which has many colorful bands. Uh, the first one is like the, how many people see this? How many click on this? How many people click on the next one? And I'm just saying, hey, please uh, divide this number so divide this number by the total number of people that clicked and, and so far so that you can get the percentages. Is it clear? Okay, awesome. Yeah, so that's the first step. And then we are actually creating something that are like the polygons of a, of a funnel because what we want to create at the end is something like this, right? This one. So these are the stages. And we want to create something like this with ggplot. You see, it's really nice, I think. Um, so we are just 
setting things, as I said, I haven't changed anything here because the only thing I change is in the stages where I have to specify which are my variable that I have to divide by. Um, so I do this over here. And then here I am setting my uh, ggplot. So this is something that we are more familiar with. I decided that I want to have a, a my colorful palette. So I don't want any defined palette. I want to have fun with this. So I am loading my palette. And then I'm saying, OK, uh, what I want is to have um, a yeah, a chart that it's called funnel. And here I'm taking Tupoli, which is the data that I created. I'm gonna show you what Tupoli looks like. This is like this, right? So this is a, a, tab a table where I said, okay, how many people got confirmed the subscription? This is 0.2%. Uh, uh, and this is group one, group two, you'll see how it looks like. But this is a table that um, allows me to create this fancy funnel that I'm going to put out here. And here, it's how it looks like. Fancy, right? I was very proud of the colorful, the, the choice of colors. <laughs> that was when I had the most fun, to be, to be honest. Uh, but the idea is that you can see now, okay, so if 100% of people clicked on upgrade, so I'm starting with 100, of course, because that's where the you have to give it a, a 100, 100 something clicked on something at the beginning. How many of those people saw the in-app price? 96%. How many of them choose the, the plan and move to see the payment? 17%. You see, there is a huge drop here. And how many people actually paid, so confirmed the payment? Only 2.6%. So I'm going to show you what it looks like in a, in a presentation so that we can discuss these results in a, in a nicer environment. I'm sorry for, for skipping through this. OK. OK, so we wanted to see, OK, freemium to premium, OK? And we, here we have all of the stages that we mentioned before. And then we have the plot that we just put down. Uh, and how do we read this? And how do we make insights from this? So what do we learn from this? We learned that about 80% of the times users initiate the flow, they actually leave after seeing the pricing option. Why I'm saying this? Because we move from 96% to 17%. So I click upgrade, I see the pricing page and I flee. Bye, this is not for me. This is just too much. So that's the first, the first dropping point. It could be the many people that register in your experiment and then the small percentage of people that actually show off on the day of the experiment when we still used to have people showing off in, in, in our universities. So that could be something like that, right? Maybe usually it's not only 20%, but sometimes if you have multiple days, it could be like the number reduces, right? And then what we also see is that only 15% of the times the users who selected the, the users that select a plan, so they choose a plan when they see the payment, only 15% only of these people, so 2.6 of the total, actually finalize the subscription and pay and have something bought. So this is really important because it means that you know, you're creating a lot of friction to people. And people are not paying. So somehow this tells something about, uh, you know, maybe this funnel is not working. Or if it's working, only if you have a lot of people developing things and doing things, but maybe this is not leading the results that you want, right? Um, and I want you to now maybe do a step uh, further and try to understand um, if we can do something else that, that we can suggest some new changes or something cool. Uh, but I want to leave maybe now a couple of seconds for questions, if there are. So I'm aware this all analytics, um, it can be a bit like scary at the beginning uh, if, you, if you move from academia to industry. Um, but actually, it's, sim it's like the simple version of statistics. If 
you think of it. We haven't done any t-test, we haven't done any ANOVA, we haven't done any linear regression. We're just simply looking at percentages and proportions, right? Um, so that's uh, do, do, do not get too scared by the SQL snippets because they, um, as I said, they are like the granny of R, um, and it's nothing like nothing super complicated. Everybody can pick it up seriously. Okay. So Sarah, when you like yeah. um, talk to the companies and like you are the data scientist, but there's other people in the company, do you just sort of present this kind of figure? It's not like you send them your beautiful markdown file. You just sort of show them the end product kind of thing. Is that how? Um, yeah. So it depends to who you are to whom you're talking to. So it's like all stakeholder dependent, right? So if you're the final person who is um, getting this information is the product manager. The product manager doesn't necessarily have the, uh, maybe the, um, it doesn't have to, they, they don't, they will see maybe a presentation like this every week. So they don't really have the time to go through your whole analysis. They will trust you've done your, your job. Um, and that what you're showing is the inside. So they have to take this information and make it into an actionable decision, right? Uh, which maybe it's something like, oh, we have to lower the, the plans because they are too expensive. People are scared and, and they leave, for instance. Um, if you're working with a team of analysts um, or you have people around you that are more data oriented, then you may have actually the opportunity to share the, the code and the script and you can discuss maybe, maybe you have some doubts, maybe you are like, mm, can you please make sure that this makes sense? Or do you have another way in which I can measure that? And then of course your, your script would be uh, something that you look at together with different people. But the whole point is that really depends on the level of details that you uh, need to share for the person to make actions that have any value. Um, so, yeah. Thank you for your question. Okay, any other question? Okay, so then I move on to the next bit, which I think maybe uh, rings about um, about for you in terms of like thinking, because you see that there is a lot of like um, like similar processes going on from research, like academic research and industry research. And in this case, for instance, put in you're in the shoes of this poor product analyst. They have to tell they have to tell their product managers uh, that this is not working. So what can they offer instead of just telling them this is a piece of shit is not working? Um, what can you do? What you can think of like, hmm, are there maybe some features that are uh, bringing more value uh, than others from a user point of view? So if I'm clicking onto something and I think it's more valuable for me, maybe I'm gonna be more likely to buy. Um, can we have a look? Because before we only had like an overall uh, understanding of the problem, right? Maybe there are differences. Um, and in fact, if you think of this, like if, if you have a feature and many, many people clicked on it, what does it mean? from a product perspective? Well, it means that it's highly discoverable, right? So imagine you have an app and you keep clicking on that button over there, that icon. It actually means that the icon is visible, right? So it's easy to click on it because it's there, it's visible. But it doesn't mean necessarily that it's valuable, that it's leading to a valuable thing. It just means that it's there, it's visible, and my finger keeps going there. Um, and my pointer with my mouse or anything, I keep seeing it and I click on it. Uh, now, there is a difference between something that it's discoverable and something that maybe it's potentially a needing um, or um, that maybe it leads to some curiosity on my side. And when we are, what we are going to look at is this uh, click-through rate that we mentioned before. So if I click on something that it's locked and then it makes me go and click on upgrade, it means, huh, I'm curious. Uh, this is something I may need. So how much should I pay to get it, right? But finally, if you want to understand if that thing, it's really bringing value to you as a user, the only thing you have to look at is what is the feature that it's gonna bring more people in? So what is the features that no matter how many times you click on it, maybe you only 10 times you click on it, but all of the 10 times people are buying. 
So it means that's something that you want, that's something that people need. Uh, and this is value, like, I'm happy with this, I'm happy to pay, it's worth my money. So that's the idea, right? So that's like one example in which you, you want to go beyond you, your um, bad news about the funnel not being super successful. You want to say, hey, wait, I, have, I may have some, some backend story for you. This can be more insightful and more actionable for you than the simple story like, huh, fuck, you lose 80% of people. Hmm, poor you, right? So that's what we're going to do now. Um, okay, so we had seen this before. Yeah, so now we are in this. So features, value. So as I said, the most compelling question that came to my mind while I was doing this is like, hmm, are these any locked feature that has added value? And here, what we have to do is some data preparation to obtain consistent data because we saw that the naming was not one-to-one -one mapping. Uh, so we are literally using anything that in R, I think replace maybe it's something, or you know, when you simply write a function that says, if something is called this way, then rename it in this other way, right? That's a simple renaming procedure. Um, and we are using this uh, DB execute and I'm saying, hey, update please. And update, um, so it has to be click, it has to be called show overboards limit pop-up anytime it's called overboards limit banner because it's very similar, right? So it's overboard something, overboard limits. So put this one together with this thing that is called banner and with this thing that it's called overboards limit banner. And here an example of how, you know, two things that are the same, just because two different people call them. Come on, this is like overboards limit banner board, overboards limit banner. So this happens a lot in, in um, real life data when it's very dirty and two developers are doing the job and they don't know each other maybe and they're not checking the code of someone else. So we are just renaming things so that we, have, uh, we don't have all of those inconsistencies uh, that we saw before. And just running this little script and it will do it for us. Um, and now we are going to do that. Okay, so we need to calculate what is the total number of clicks for each one of these functionalities that we saw before, these features. And um, I want to see how clickable. So first of all, I want to discover the one that people can see, the most visible one. So this thing that people click always because it's there, it's easy. It's by default, it's biased as well, right? So if I'm clicking on something, it's not me deciding I want to see this banner. It just pops up. So uh, it's not, it's, it's it's somehow biased data, right? It's the product manager that decided to put the banner there. So I'm saying, hey, please select uh, all of these uh, features and count how many people, how many clicks you have. So count the total number of clicks since many people can click multiple times. Please tell also how many people in total they are clicking on this and tell me how many actually go and upgrade because of that. Okay, so the, the different steps. And here we have it over here. It takes a bit of time because it's loading live. Yeah, it takes so long. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have run it. I actually had the table down there. I'm sorry. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Okay. Ah, and you see also here, I have a left join, which maybe it's more familiar for Deplier and Tidyverse, right? So the idea of joining one thing with another. So if we had a CSV file, we would load all the rows. Here, we already are loading the summary tables together so that we don't have to then do another extra step. I promise this should do soon. <laughs> okay. Yes, there it is. Let me just pull it out for you over here. Okay, so we have here seven different features. And what we have is how many times, how many clicks in total I have for every feature. 
right? So this tell us that this one is the most visible, the most, the, the most, the, the one that comes up the most. Then here we have, hey, since many people can click on the same things multiple times, tell me the unique number of users. And then tell me how many move to the next step, which is clicking on upgrade button. And here we have. And now what we are going to do is uh, show it in a plot for you so that you see how it looks like in a bar plot. So we do some, some preparation. So something we use here, we actually use uh, tidyverse or deplier. Now I'm confused. <laughs> uh, so we use mutate. With the pipeline, was it is it tidyverse or deplier now? Tidyverse, deplier. Yeah, I think it's tidyverse. Okay, awesome. <laughs> tidyverse is the pipeline. <laughs> okay, awesome. So then we have mutate. So we are again creating percentages. We are customizing some labels. So you will see on the first very first bar there will be something like percentage uh, of all clicks done on locked features. And then I'm using different colors to mark the winner features so that you see them nicely and um, it's cool. And here is the ggplot script. So I'm just using my y axis is the total clicks on features. And then my um, x axis is the features, right? I'm reordering them in order so that we have different, uh, like they are all nicely ordered. And then I'm using some, yeah, some labels to make them more nice because I, I don't like when you have things like, wait, where is it? Like this underscore over here, I don't like it. So I'm just uh, getting rid of the underscores and make them nicer and using some colors. So I'm gonna show you how it looks like. And here we are. So we have this beautiful plot that says, huh, Okay, so here we have the most clicked features. So this tell me that this private board seems to be a functionality that people really, really happen to click on, right? So it's something that, that opens the pop-up. Um, the second one is the overboard limit. We can call it feature two. And the pink one is the third winner on the podium. And you see, and then you have these small ones, the things that people don't happen to click on and what I'm trying to understand is they don't click on them because they are not useful or because they are not easy to see and discover. Oh, I see, okay, Paolo. Deplier is part of Tidyverse, so loading Tidyverse would automatically load also Deplier. Okay, awesome, thank you. This is where it's coming with the different, the, I guess the metaverse of Facebook, right? So Tidyverse is like the family and then you have Deplier is one of the required packages. Okay, and wait. thank you. Okay. So most clicked one. Now, please let's have a look at what are the most convincing, I think convincing uh, features so that they are the one that push people to keep going in the funnel, okay? So I'm gonna do exactly the same by looking at the next step. So the next one in the flow. Okay, this may take shorter, awesome. So now the same feature and I'm adding the same stuff. So how many people click on upgrade? Same plot over here. And then we have a different story. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna move this to the presentation. So you see them compared one against each other. So they pitched one against each other. Okay, so here we have percentage of total clicks on lock features. So we are saying, Hey, of all of the time people, so let, let me break it down in the, this way, right? So um, of all of the time people have clicked on a feature, 25% they clicked on this private board functionality, number one. Another 24% of the time they clicked on this board thing, we call it feature two. And um, about, yeah, 19% they click on this and the rest on this other stuff. Now, if the most click one were also the one that people see like valuable, then you should have like a mirror picture over here, right? But this is not the case. So you see private board, although many people happen to see it, to click on it, 
not many people move to the next step. This is like the penultimate thing in order. So yeah, a lot of people, a lot of people click on it. It's very visible. But then if you have to make the next step, decision making, nope, not really convincing. I don't think this is something valuable, my money. Uh, same happens with the overboard limits. Very, very popular. I mean, it's easy to, to trigger the banner. Doesn't mean I'm going to move and buy the paid account. Maybe it's, I would say, maybe it's even because it's always there. It's like YouTube premium, right? It's always there. It's not going to make you buy it if you always show me the same banner over and over, right? And the opposite happened. So the, the guys, they were sitting the laggers at the back, at the, the bottom of the, of the first chart are actually the winners of the other one. So uh, although these things are not very easy to find, when you find it, you care for it, right? So um, the, this idea that you know, value doesn't mean necessarily um, visibility. It's very, very popular also in, in, when you think of like user experience, right? So do not confound, confound the two things together. Okay, so um, now the last bit, and then I, I can maybe take some questions if you have. So the next step that we mentioned is like, okay, people go, click, okay, but who buys? I want to know who are the people that buy the plan and why they do it. What is the thing that they really see as added value worth my money? Um, so what we are going to do here is calculate this conversion rate that we mentioned before. And here you see that the calculation is a bit more complex than before, so the query. But what it's doing is literally saying, hey, please um, count. So do, do a count like over the whole thing, right? Like we saw before. So instead of step by step, do the whole count. So how many people have seen something uh, at the beginning and started this flow, this funnel? And how many of these people have actually ended the flow and are popping out at the other extremity? And tell me uh, if this is a difference from, uh, from the different features they are coming from. So over here, same, um, same, literally the same structure in terms of ggplot. I always have three different colors depending on what is the, the first winner, the second winner, and the third one. I'm preparing this and um, I'm putting everything into a, a ggplot um, object. So you have it here. And I also added a little um, dotted line that it's the average, I put it somewhere here. Oh, sorry. This should be the average, let me try to understand. The mean upgrade flow conversion rate. So it's just a mean and it's, it serves as to understand, you know, what is the mean usually? So what is the mean of conversion rate across all of these features so that I can compare if it's above the average or below or around the average, okay? So I have it here and this is how I would describe it over here. So I would say, okay, what is the percentage of conversion rates on the same day? So this is what I did also. So if you're seeing a banner and the banner pushes you to pay the subscription on the same day, that's what I'm considering. Because if you buy the next day, then I don't know why you're doing it, right? So the banner is the one that same day kind of idea is the one that um, pushing here. And what you're seeing is that um, 2.6 is the first percentage that we saw at the very beginning when we had the, the big funnel, the initial one, you remember? So it was only 2% of people that were actually buying the subscription. So that's the same mean they have here. And what we can do is pitching against each other, the different features and say, hey, apparently this overboard thingy, it's bringing double the number of people through the funnel. Seems to be something people see as an added value. Um, it must be something people really want. And it must be something that you as a product manager are doing well because they actually pay for it. And the same goes with this, Backup, so the opportunity to back up your 
data, for instance, it's something that you don't want to lose. If you lose your data, you're, you're screwed. So um, this is something that people are paid for. Um, and then the rest of them are more or less around or a bit less than uh, the mean. So that the actual the winners are these two guys over here. So what do we learn from this if we were to talk to um, stakeholder? So having more than, I can tell you that this is something like you can have more than three boards, right? More than three spaces, three, three, whatever you want, three, three accounts. Yes, you are having Disney Plus or Netflix. And what I'm telling you is that Netflix and Disney Plus is for free. You wish. No, <laughs> no. I mean, the idea is that it's for free if you don't have more than three accounts. Um, and if you have, if you want to have a fourth account for your mom, then she has to pay for all of all of the rest. That's the idea, right? Um, so having more than three accounts, uh, it's something that it's it, it was highly discoverable because we saw it also at the beginning uh, in the previous one. Um, many times, user. So if we go back here, so overboards was the second one, the third penultimate. The, whatever it's called, uh, the third last one, uh, but it's the first one over here. So it means that it's highly discoverable, comes up a lot of time because people tend to have three accounts, three, more than three accounts on Netflix. Um, and um, it comes up many times, it's highly discoverable. Not all the time, people are going to pay for it. Sometimes just they say, just, I don't want it. But still, the majority of people uh, that decide to pay, they do it because they see it, right? So that's the kind of the twist. Um, and this backup board was not highly discoverable. It was like laggering over here at the bottom, uh, but it was one of the top over here on the right. So what does it mean is that it was not highly discoverable, but users initiate the upgrade flow to a larger degree than other features when clicking on it. And it also contributes to the second highest conversion rate. So it's something that uh, maybe the product manager should capitalize a bit more on, right? So that's the idea. Um, so I'm just gonna, uh, you remember our last task was, hey, you have to prove, uh, you have to, to suggest uh, hypotheses that then the product team will test and see if they make sense. And you have to suggest some changes that will make uh, the, their job easier. So what can we improve if we were to talk to that? Well, we learned that the first thing was the pricing page. So 80% of people were scared off and they were leaving the flow at the very beginning. So maybe, hey, product manager, make that screen less scary maybe offer some monthly prices. Maybe, maybe you don't bill 2000 euro all at once. You pay um, 10 euro per month. Maybe people will be happier. Uh, maybe make it less dense of information. Maybe it's too much. Just give two tiers, not so many. Um, and maybe consider some like break it down because one page full of information, it's, it's definitely too complex. Breaking down in small, tiny bits. The same happens with our participants. Don't make like all the information on one page if you want to have them on Gorillas. If you can screen them in multiple pages, then allow them to go from one bit to another because otherwise it's too much, it's too dense. Um, what we saw also is that only 2.6 people move so that that kind of, okay, I choose this plan, I have to put the data in and then I have to pay and only 15% of people were moving from, I choose and I pay. And maybe there is something, hey, product manager, maybe there is something wrong with your payment uh, options. Maybe you have too few options available. Uh, maybe you have something like, oh, you have to use credit card if you're a consultant, you have to use, you have invoice, so too complex. Please, product manager, maybe what we are suggesting is make it simple. Add um, Google Play or Apple Pay or PayPal um, API so that people can pay easily. And finally, this is the last one that we will look at together. Um, when we look at locked features, uh, leverage, please, what brings value. So take into account that discoverability doesn't mean need. And um, make more discoverable 
value driven features. So the thing that we saw, not highly discoverable, but was like the second highest conversion rate. So um, this were like the, the example. Yeah, so this was all. I'm uh, really happy and I grateful for the opportunity to uh, share with you this little um, pipeline of analysis. Um, they maybe was a lot of new things, um, especially with SQL, uh, but the, I'm happy to have brought you for a um, bit less than a couple of hours through this uh, product analytics uh, kind of word. And I'm happy if you have any questions to uh, answer them. Thank you very much, Sarah. That was super interesting. I think, well, I'm not from that background, but it's very, like, a, I come from academia, but it's very interesting to see the way different things are done, but also how applicable it is to the skills that we might develop in academia. And before people start going off, I'm just going to share in the chat and a link to our mailing list. If you are not already on it, you can sign up via that mailing list. And then when we have the resources, we will share them via the mailing list, for example, the YouTube link. We will also share it on Twitter, so don't worry. But if you do want to join our mailing list, you can. So I know people might start having to go now. So yeah, thank you ever so much, Sarah. Please, people, if you have questions, ask her. <laughs> Can I also ask a question about like leaving academia? I'm also happy to <laughs> if you have any 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 uh, curiosity because I've been in in I've I've been in that that side of the <laughs> that side. I of can the definitely line. recommend Sarah for conversations about that. <laughs> yes. Sarah and I had many chats about this. <laughs> yes, yes, many times. We yes. Have to I actually have a, a question. So I'm obviously mm -hmm. from the academic background, so I know nothing about um, industry. And so it's a very broad question. But so other than this type of analysis, which other analysis do you use? And maybe uh, in particular, are there analysis that you used to use in academia that you also mm -hmm. use in industry? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so let's say that there is a big difference between like analytics that you keep tracking uh, over time. So what we see now, the proportions and these things. Um, so they, they just something that you keep tracking maybe on a dashboard that it's always there. One of those fancy dashboard that people have. And um, when I use mostly, so for, if, even for that case, I wouldn't even use something like R because it's always there. So it's usually hosted on a platform, something that it's sitting on the on internet that people can access by a, a web page. Um, the thing, the, the occasions where I use the most my uh, more um, traditional statistical knowledge, if you want, um, is when, uh, because I work in a product team, so I have a lot of the, these are like the use cases that I'm used to. Uh, and the most common one when I have to use my, my stats is when I have A-B testing. So A-B testing literally means that you have two different versions of the same thing. So it could be the same app or it could be the same message that it's displayed. It could be different layout, maybe different colors. So I don't know if it ever happened that you and some of, someone of your friends has a different color or the, you know, the the button on, on Netflix, talking about Netflix. So for a while, the skip to skip the intro, the when you have when you have the possibility to skip the, you know, the, the recap or the summary. So for a while, that button was not accessible to everybody. It was actually shown at the very beginning, they didn't know that that was something that was gonna, you know, that people were gonna love, right? Mm -hmm. Also because how do you validate this, right? There is no theory saying, hey, if you have a skip summary button, people are gonna are gonna be happy about that. So what usually happens in a product is the, is that you you have a test to make sure that if you develop something like that, people are gonna appreciate it and they will uh, enjoy it and they may actually be happier. And so they show they show the, that button only to a certain percentage of users. So Netflix was having I don't know thirty percent of users that would see it at the very beginning, mm -hmm. and all of the rest of the people were not seeing it. And, and then you have a, literally an experiment. It's literally like a hypothesis, right? So it's like, I hypothesize, I hypothesize that by having this button, um, the time that people spend on Netflix is larger, mm -hmm. something like that. Or that I watch more episodes one after the other. Could be something, something of this type. 
Um, so I have this hypothesis and I have two different versions, which are exactly two conditions, right? Two experimental conditions. And in that case, what you do, you can analyze the data exactly. So you have a time frame, and you say for a month, for three weeks, for a week, depending on how many people you also have in your participants pool, you can say, okay, after a while, I'm going to stop this. And the data that I collected will tell me if I have to invest more on this and roll it out to everybody, or if I only want to keep it for, um, for I don't want to, I don't want to have it anymore uh, for everybody else. And so there it's when you can do, um, you can do very simple t-test in those cases, yeah. if you need, or a chi-square, if it's a matter of proportions, or you can do a linear regression, multiple linear regression. So depending, of course, on how many conditions you have, because sometimes you only have two other times you have like a factor um, four by four condition. So it really depends. And, and you, you can use then, you can use R because you, you can take the data set and transform it into um, yeah, a statistical test. Mm -hmm. That would be like the most, the closest that I went yeah. to um, academia and, and academic experimentation. That's mm -hmm. Okay. Someone is saying here, could we have a near future AV test session? You're very popular, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> for AV testing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, could, we should try it. You have to put someone else who does exactly the same thing and has the same slides and codes and repeat exactly the same things, but with a different face. And then we see if it's me or the topic. <laughs> like that. <laughs> that would be the AV testing. <laughs> or you change the color of my hair as well. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe easier. <laughs> like the term AV testing is not something that you really hear in academia but when you break it down it's the same it's the same stuff basically isn't it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. true true yeah for me it was also a like it's it's coming from exactly where you're the place where you're standing at the moment so i i know how it seems scary but then at certain moments it's like oh no this analytic stuff it's actually not so scary <laughs> it's one of the simplest things, the descriptive analysis that we do at the beginning of a of um, we, we're yeah, our beginning of a pipeline, right? That's that's most uh, most of it. The concepts are a bit more complex, maybe. Uh, I see many questions. Are there questions? I mean, I see many things in there. Yeah. Oh, no. yeah. The mailing list. Okay. Okay, awesome. So they were all about, um, yep, awesome. 